Greetings, my name is Neosekin, and welcome back to my Let's Play of Higurashi When They Cry Chapter 4. In the last episode, we begun Chapter 4 of Higurashi proper, and rather than playing as Keiichi or anybody associated with the club, we have gone back a few years in time to the time of the Dam Wars, and we're now playing as a new character, Akasaka, an uh, investigator of the uh, Public Safety Division in the Metropolitan Police in Tokyo. And he is basically, and in, in he is basically uh, going, and he basically went to Hinamizawa because the because it was around this this time during the Dam Wars that the Minister of Construction's uh, grandson was kidnapped, and he's and he was basically following any leads that he could that he could to try to determine who the kidnappers could be, and well, along with the rest of uh, the Public Safety Division. Who's, who are off trying to investigate their own any possible leads of their own throughout other areas of the country. Uh, Akasaka was uh, sent to Hinamizawa, even though uh, the supervisor in the public safety division undoubtedly felt that it was um, not likely that the kidnappers were probably in any way related to the region and any of the conflict that was actually going on at the dam. At least I think that's what, what what was said. I could be wrong about that, but anyway. And well, shortly after getting there and talking to uh, some of the local uh, local uh, law law officials, Asaka has pretty much come eventually come to the conclusion that uh, the kidnappers may very well be related to uh, one of the local uh, three families that um, has con that supposedly controls Hinamizawa from the shadows, that being the Sonazakis, and. With uh, Detective Ushi's help, who he ended up meeting uh, shortly after arriving in Okinomiya, he is going to try to uh, use any connections that Ushi knows and, and Ushi may have here to try to gather any information he can that could uh, point to the Sonozaki's involvement in the kidnappings in any way, even a tiny hint of any, any anything that he can get his hands on. And so, yeah. In the meantime, I guess we're just basically going to be doing our own investigating on this on the side here while trying to keep a relatively low profile while we're in Hinamizawa because since we're still t in the middle of the dam war, things are very tense in the village right now. And I think that pretty much covers the gist of everything. So before I hit continue and start in the next part of chapter 4, we have some tips to go through. 4 to be precise. The first is the phone call with Yukie. So this guy. Oh, really? It's tough when it's such a sudden assignment. Please be careful. Where are you headed? You're already there. Whenever I headed out on assignment, she would ask where. Not just Yukie, but anybody would have asked the same question. If it was a cold place, she would urge me to pack a thick jacket. If it was far, she'd warn me to be careful in the drive over. It was just normal everyday it was just normal everyday concern that led to asking such an obvious thing. I felt sad that I couldn't answer such a run-of-the-mill question. Sorry. It's something that you can't talk about, isn't it? Please be careful. Sorry, Yukie. At some point, you... At some point, you started apologizing right away. Even though when you first started your job, you were all gung-ho about it. <laughs> Yuki laughed as though she had realized something. At times like this, Yuki had the magical power to see right through me. It's already been quite a while since I was admitted to the hospital. Are you finally getting lonely? Don't tease me. I'm too old to get lonely. 
さてさていかがでしょう<笑>あなたは本当に甘えん坊さんですからね。Oh, really? You actually like to be doted on, don't you? These lines are not stopping as far, as far back as they should be. It's kind of throwing my pace off a bit. Don't you, don't, don't you start getting a little faint of heart when I'm not around? I can see the little devil horns sprouting from your head right now. You've always been like this. You can't hide it, you can't hide it. If I don't play with you, you get all lonely. I can hear your tail wagging over the phone. <laughs> the sight of Yuke wasn't something you could guess existed from seeing her usual moss behavior, and it was something that she didn't show to anybody else but me. Normally, I'd poke her to hide my embarrassment and bring, it, and bring an end to the conversation, but I couldn't do that over the phone. Of course, Yukie was clever. She was teasing me because of that. <laughs> I wonder when I figured out that giving you grief was this much fun. Give me a break. In any case, it's good to hear you so lively. I know, right? Did I cheer you up? I'd called Yukie to keep her from feeling lonely when she was by herself in the hospital room. Of course, that was nothing more than a pretense that I. Being shy had come up with. It seemed that Yuki had long since seen through that act. <laughs> yeah. Please phone again. When I'm not feeling up to, I'll get my father to talk with you. Although, if you're talking with my father, I get the feeling that you'd be standing at attention on the other side of the line. <laughs> For a while longer, Yukie kept teasing me without letting me end the call. Well? Nothing else. I think you two have a cute relationship, even though I do feel kind of bad here that the nature of your work does separate you two very often. A record of opening remarks. Chairman XX. Members of the XX party. Congratulations are due, as we are celebrating 25 years since our founding. These past 25 years have seen much growth in XX Prefecture. The once quiet scenery of nothing but fields now has seen the opening of a new stop for the bullet train. And with the development of the highway, we've seen the rebirth of a modern city bursting with youthful energy. We've reaped the benefits of new businesses and industry. And with a special reverence, the residents of XX Prefecture have for time honored tr traditions. History and culture, business and industry. With these ideals in harmony, they have accomplished in growing their city into, into one of Japan's most foremost metropolises. Of course, the development of Double, of double X Prefecture couldn't have happened without the growth of the Double X Party. We are resolved to see every one of our campaign promises to fruition, reaching our targets definitively and expediently like arrows fired from a bow. With these arrows as the fundamental basis of the Double X Party, our members have sought to pierce the obstructions preventing the happiness of the residents of the Double X Prefecture. But I do believe that everybody here is unlike an ordinary arrow. 
while being as unfaltering and straightforward, we have not neglected in seeking solutions that conform to the current day and age, while also keeping an eye on the future. An arrow, once loosed, can only fly to its destination. Everyone here, however, is no simple arrow. Even once loosed from the bow, without neglecting our studies, while employing new methods, and implementing more effective and flexible ideas, thus being able to change trajectories mid-flight, we are magical arrows. The modern age marches ever forward. Sometimes it marches faster than the time taken from planning to execution. The following part was not in the script. It is thought to have been ad-libbed by the minister. For example, there have recently been numerous problems with the Hinamizawa power plant project. Rather than forcing through the project solely because it was decided upon by the government, it is necessary to reflect on and adjust to the ever-changing needs of the residents, the region, and the next generation. The protests by the local residents that surround the Hinamizawa Dam, these are also the will of the people of Double X Prefecture. If you feel that there is no need to listen because the project has already been finalized, then you do nothing more than shed a poor light on Japan's post-war democracy. The following is as per the script. For the lasting happiness of the citizens of Japan and the residents of Double X Prefecture, please consider these policies thoroughly. I believe, however, we have all gained something from the flexibility and foresight of the Double X Party. I have taken up much of your time. However, allow me to say the following to celebrate the 25th anniversary of our founding. Chairman Double X, members of the Double X Party in attendance, thank you very much for today. From the opening remarks of the Double X Party Prefectorial Forum and 25th Anniversary Celebration. So, mentioning Hinamizawa in any capacity directly was not part of the original script, huh? I wonder if having done so in this, in this little opening remark proper would have caused some kind of issue, politically speaking. Gears and fire and a taste of honey. None of these things sound like they go well together, but honey does taste awfully sweet. The world is filled with people blessed with relationships. Of course, that doesn't mean that everyone is connected to each other. It's obvious that on the other side of the planet, there are people laughing and crying who can't possibly have an effect on you. However, in the extremely limited community of the neighborhood, that sort of connection is just a matter of fact. It's quite possible that a single remarkable event could have massive consequences inside a small community. If you were to increase that in scale, a perfect stranger on the other side of the globe might become enough of a legend to have an effect on our lives. Well, it's not always that way. Like I said at the beginning, the links between people basically aren't that relevant in the grand scheme of things. Whether some household nearby is having steak or, cro or croquettes doesn't matter to me. When I put on my shoes, it doesn't matter to anybody whether I put the right one on first or the left. This much the average person can understand. But actually, in reality, this is the truth. The bonds between people are quite well defined. It's not just a matter of distance, of being far or near. For example, 
Let's say that person A's actions has some effect on me. Even then, person B's actions could have absolutely no consequence on my life. The reverse also holds true. Just because my actions affect person A, that doesn't always mean that they affect person B as well. Let's put it bluntly. If the bonds between people are like gears in a machine, the gear that represents me meshes with some people, but is isolated from others. There are some who would try arguing against this. Those people would bring up the example of gears in a clock. Each gear indeed only directly meshes with one or two others. However, if you rotate one gear, the one next to it is moved, which connects to the next one, and the next. In the end, all the gears are moving. There is a logic behind this, more than enough to convince the average person. Why is the argument convincing? The answer is simple. The relationships between people are ambiguous can only be described conceptually. How the gears are connected and how their movements are chained together can't be used as a fundamental explanation, so it throws a wet blanket on that argument. So the people who like that expl explanation, I'll use the example of a clock again to refute it. First of all, to say that this world is a singular clock would be wrong. That is, there isn't only one clock. There exists many clocks in this world, each counting their own time. And I'm assuming we can refer, we can see these individual clocks as individual communities of people, yeah? If you think about it, the idea that this world is just one big clock is the height of arrogance. then it's a clock shop. Even if you use the analogy of gears to explain human relationships, then you should be able to explain it using an analogy of multiple clocks unrelated to a single gear. Neighbors A and B. A is a gear in the same clock as me, so it's best to remain civil. B is a gear in a different clock, so he doesn't really matter to me at all. That's the kind of clear distinction I'm talking about. You want to say I'm being fall fallacious? Then let's change the analogy to something more familiar so you can understand. You probably heard the, the phrase, a fire on the opposite shore, sometime in your life, no? Once or twice, I'd think. For example, if your neighbor's house was on fire, You'd probably try and help put it out, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. It'd be awful if the fire spread and burned down your own house, after all. Well, it wouldn't be just me I'd be looking out for. It'd be literally everything else around the fire as well. But that's just me. But what if that fire was in a town on the opposite side of a river? Would you still go out of your way to help? Well, yeah, if I, could, if I could get to it, I would try to help. You wouldn't, would you? Even though it would be wrong, the wrong thing to do, there's no way the fire could spread to your own house. Even if it turned into a huge conflagration, there's no relation between the houses that will spread fire to yours and those that won't. With this basic example, you should be able to see the difference between gears that are or aren't related to your own. Having said that, there's still a lot to think about, even without a river to divide it. After all, it's not a spatial problem like being on the other side of the river, is it? Very... 
Inter very interesting way to think about communities of people and divided communities to boot and how each how each gear so to speak interacts with the clocks that they're a part of now how exactly is all this analogy talk going to relate to what happens in this chapter I wonder the chick in the trunk The car had stopped, but he didn't know any more than that. For not only was he blindfolded, but locked in the trunk of a car. How could people become this powerless just by being robbed of their sight? He absolutely wouldn't have known this without experiencing it firsthand. He soon realized it was pointless to try and undo his bonds, with the confines of the tr trunk quickly making him lightheaded. He had no choice but to let this mild torture dull his senses. Are you the grandson that got kidnapped by chance? That's why, when the car stopped and the unpleasant vibration ceased as the engine was killed, he couldn't help but delude himself that he was being set free, even though he had even though nothing had been resolved in reality. Of course, he was soon removed from that delusion. He strained his ears when he heard one of the men who had abducted him, and an older man he was hearing for the first time strike, a, strike up a conversation. It has to be the kid. Nice to meet you. The chick is in the trunk. Oh, you, oh, you meant check as in... Like a chick, as in a baby chicken. I thought you meant chick as in lady. He struggled so much that he's probably exhausted right now, but there's not a mark on him, just as ordered. Oh, oh must have been a handful. The trunk opened, laying in a blast of fresh, cool air. Even though up until na until just now he had been thinking about getting out of that stuffy trunk, when it was actually opened, he suddenly became uneasy. Enough so that he wished that the little trunk would close would once again close, separating himself from them. Suddenly, somebody stroked his head. Of course, since he was blindfolded, he couldn't tell if the hand was petting him or simply evaluating how easy it would be to remove his scalp. Unable to tell the difference, he could only freeze as he imagined the worst-case scenario. Poor little bugger. He's a shaken. Just stay calm for a bit. The older man said that kindly as he dro gently stroked the boy's head. This must be real tough for you. But you see, your Gramps is a nice man. He'll help you soon enough. Having heard nothing but the average standard dialect his whole life, the older man's distinct in a, in, um, intonation left a deep impression on the boy. But he had no idea what he was saying. For your gramps to register as meaning your grandfather took a while to process. Their manner of sp this guy's manner of speaking, it's kind of, it reminds me of, um, those thugs from back from chapter uh, two, the same ones that Katie, um, for some reason, messed with by kicking her bikes down. A little, a, a, that small gang of bikers. So, I'm bringing this up because I'm assuming that um, their accent here is, well, 
the same thing basically meaning that these guys are some kind of gangsters too and if that's the case then well i think it may very well be the yakuza's in the sonozaki family because well yakuza is basically an organized an organized crime syndicate so yeah if if this if this guy's accent is any indication then this could very well be a strong indi a strong indicator that the Sonozakis were definitely involved. Well, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Like I forget. Mion in chapter two. Did she actually confirm that uh, they kidnapped? That they that, that the Sonzakis actually kidnap the grandson of the of the minister of construction because I'm pretty sure that was brought up at some point during that during the end of chapter two. I want to say yes, she did confirm that, and I'm just not remembering it for some re clearly for some reason. Anyway. Eventually, the hand that was stroking his head loosened the blindfold. Can't keep his eyes covered. If he spits his face, if it's if he splits his face open, it'd be bad. Hmm. And with that. Might as well take out of that gag. You can't breathe like that. It'll be trouble if he yells. Leave him to us. Jeez. Jeez, you guys don't know how to treat somebody. The main family said no rough stuff. Main family, I think that's even stronger evidence. You better remember that well. Yeah. We won't do anything stupid. As long as the kid cooperates, that is. The man's hand prodded roughly and repeatedly at the boy's head. A rugged hand, unlike the affection one that's been stroking his head before. Just stay cooperative. If you struggle, there's no guarantee what will happen. That cliched threat was literally beaten into his head. Just try not to aggravate your kidnappers, kid. That's all I can recommend to you. Okay, let's hit continue now. What a lovely generic painting that you got on this wall here. Waking up in a cheap hotel in the city was by no means pleasant. I remembered even during the long camping trips we had during grade school, I wanted to get home quickly, counting out the days left on my fingers. Waking up this morning, I was somehow reminded of that. Was it a need to be with my wife when she gave birth? A particular type of homesickness? As a productive member of society, as a public servant bound to fulfill his duties, it was pathetic indeed. Those negative emotions faded as I downed my breakfast, which was surprisingly not half bad. The meeting with the informant that Aushi had provided would be tonight. Until then, I couldn't just be lazing around. The Onigafuchi Defense Alliance was protesting the dam's construction in various ways. Included in this was a strategy for improving public relations, 
which could be categorized into two major forms, combative and peaceful. In regards to the former, as an attempt to keep law enforcement in check, they appeal to the public's sympathy by highlighting the oppressive and inhumane tactics of the police and the brutality of riot squads, of the riot squads. The latter, peaceful, the latter, the latter peaceful route stressed how precious the natural surroundings of Hiramizawa was, seeking people who would oppose the dam on environmental grounds. As a part of that, the village of Hinamazawa had in, had invited celebrated zoologists and botanists, as well as environmental environmental groups, to advertise the nature surrounding the town. According to the news, in recent years there had been a group calling itself Hinamazawa Nature Watching, setting up free sightseeing tours. I would have liked to have taken advantage of the opportunity. But when I called the, the village administrative staff offices, they responded that it was too late to put in an application for the tour, and they were still undecided as to when they'd be doing another one. So, that's gone. so nature scene tours, huh? I wonder if Tomataki is. I wonder if Tomataki is around. I see. So there's no applications for next time. Too bad. Are you a member of an environmental group? Or maybe somebody from a magazine? No, just here privately. Privately, then you're a tourist. Something like that. It's my hobby to take pictures that display how beautiful nature can be. I read in a magazine that there were some precious nature reserves here, so I was looking forward to it. I knew there was an article that had something like that written in it, if I hadn't actually read it. Was this ad-libbed lie not going to work? However, contrary to my expectations, the person I was speaking to laughed happily. <laughs> then come, come! The village is a little busy right now, but you're totally welcome here. <laughs> In that case, I'll graciously accept the offer. Thank you. How are you going? How are you getting around? Car? If that's a place, could I ask you for your license plate number? <laughs> No, no, there's no ulterior motive behind that. <laughs> okay, I believe you. That was, sarca that was sarcasm, by the way. That was probably related to the checkpoints they'd set up on the way to the village. If I didn't give him my license plate number, I'd most likely be hindered in various ways. I thought about using the car I'd borrowed from the prefecture, but I was lost on whether it was okay to tell him that plate number. If the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance was behind this incident, there's no guarantee that they wouldn't be able to find out who I was. I had to play it safe, so I elected to refrain from using the car. Then I got two suggestions, two suggestions for you. Use a taxi if, if one is available. Or get yourself a bike. Get, get your, yeah. Give yourself a little a bit of exercise. No. Actually, I'm not using a car. If there's a bus or something, I'd prefer that. 
We do have a bus, actually. The route is the route is going to be discontinued soon, though. You can take that. It departs from Okinomiya Station. Thank you very much. I look for I'll look out for it. You do uh, shut off my phone's vibration vibration for a second. Well, not for a second, but yeah. There. Now we won't have to worry about that going off again. When will you be coming? Is it your first time in Hinamizawa? If it is, you must be unsure about a lot of things. If you let me know, I can have somebody show you around. Oh no. I couldn't ask that much of you. <laughs> Don't worry about it. That's, that's just a little bit of, P, of PR we do to protect nature around the village. Judging by what I saw at the checkpoint, the villagers were at the very least wary of outsiders. That's why in order to move in and out of the village freely, I had to travel with somebody like Wushi, or side of the dam protests. Having an interest in the natural environment surrounding the village tied into the peaceful type of PR that the village was using. I was a bit against having a watchdog attached to me, but that might actually work out in my favor. The entire village was fired up about the dam protests, so I might be lucky enough to hear some especially candid opinions from the residents. Given that, there was no reason for me to refuse their offer. Is it really all right? If so, that will really help. After that, I was shown the bus schedule and directed to which bu bus I should get on. Somebody would come and meet me at the bus stop in the village. After showing me around a spot I'd take an interest in, there was no doubt they'd bring me to somewhere, like an anti-dam information center. Then, over a cup of tea, they'd try and indoctr indoctrinate me into accepting their principles and beliefs. Well, if that was their aim, there'd be a lot of freebies involved. The world was about give and take, after all. I couldn't be going in a suit. I pulled out some I pulled some plain clothes out of my travel case and changed into something more casual. After that, after calming down by watching some local television, I left the hotel and set out for Okinomiya station. The bus route that I was told would soon be discontinued certainly didn't look that way. There was more than enough trips on the schedule, and the number of passengers was by no means sparse. It was the main link to Okinomiya, the only town in the area. The types of passengers that stood out were older folk who didn't look like they could dry, drive, and housewives who didn't seem like they had a license. If the area was submerged at the bottom of the lake, it wouldn't matter if there was a bus route. That's why it was going to be discontinued, in the unnatural scheme of things. I could catch a glimpse of the government's intent in cutting off their means of transportation to bully the village into emptying out sooner. It makes sense. According to the documents, talks between the Ministry of Construction and the locals broke down quite early. The government decided from the start to take an aggressive stance on the matter. It was like the fairy tale with the north wind and the sun trying to get the traveler trying to get the traveler to remove his cloak. Even their bullying had meaning to it. The reason why the Onigafushi Defense Alliance resisted so violently was because the government was doing unseemly things like that. I was somebody who lived in Tokyo, 
so for a village or two out in the boonies like this to be submerged didn't seem like a big deal. And I guess this is where that where that uh, clock analogy stuff come, becomes relevant. But I guess for somebody actually living here, it would be a vitally huge problem. This route will be discontinued at the end of this financial year. Thank you for your patronage up to un, up to this point. Look forward to your continued patronage on our other lines. Okinomiya Transportation. Gazing lazily at the notice of discontinued service posted inside the bus, I count down the number of stops until the designated one. Along the way, we pass through the checkpoint before without stopping. They knew what time the bus was coming, so they had opened up the barricade ahead of time. From here on out was enemy territory. My palms had at some point become, become coated in a thin film of sweat. Personally, I think if things would be a lot more interesting, a little more thrilling, if you would actually infiltrate the village with a little bit of tactical espionage action. But that's just me. Now arriving at, Uki, uh, at Ukita Waterworks. Now arriving at Ukita Waterworks. Are there any passengers disembarking? I hurriedly pressed the stop request button as the designated stop was announced. For none of the numerous passengers to be getting off here meant that it must be quite a remote place. In actuality, the stop I got, off, I got off at was so abnormally run down that I could tell it was barely used. As soon as I stepped out, an intense atmosphere completely different than, than the interior of the bus assailed my body. And here is that old bit of familiar road. Hello, road. It's nice seeing you again. You look as lovely and pristine as ever. Right now, Wuxi or Hondia weren't beside me. That's right. At present, I was alone in the middle of enemy territory. Better get yourself a cardboard box and start sneaking around so nobody sees you. My adversaries probably thought I was just an ordinary tourist, but that was nothing more than a ruse. But if by some mistake my true identity was to be exposed. It brought back the terrifying words I had heard at the prefectural office. That if somebody was attacked in Himazawa with a knife, there wouldn't be any evidence left behind. I didn't seem suspicious, did I? My clothing was currently casual. It was exactly the type of clothing that a city slicker that viewed the countryside as a wholesome getaway would wear. A camera and knapsack. Inside were very stains needed for hiking. It was still only June, and maybe it was unusual, but the sun was shining down like it was already the middle of summer. The fact that I didn't bring a hat must seem odd. No. It wasn't something to be that concerned about. It's alright. I was just a normal tourist. Just normal. Was there anything suspicious about me? You know, the more you keep worrying about that, the more, the more suspicious vibes you're going to give off to anybody paying attention to you. Just act normal. Asking that, as I turned around to look at the bus that was departing... Uh, hello! All the passengers by the window were staring down at me, silently. Well, I didn't expect to see these eyes again. Hi! Should, I should probably be scared right now, shouldn't I? 
They were staring right at me, as if they had seen right through my proud little outfit. Just staring, looking down at me. Countless stares rained down like needles on me from the windows open to the air out to to air out the bus. All that rained down were stares. None of them were saying a word. But all the more, their silent stares told me more than a million words could. Hurry up and go back to Tokyo. You outsider. No. I'm... There was no reason for me to speak. My quiet voice was drowned out by a sound of the engine. The bus, as if to torment me, set out slowly, and after doing more than enough to intimidate me, sped off. A thin film of sweat began to rise from my entire body. According to the documents, it was a village that seemed wary of outsiders. Its population was small as well. If they saw an unfamiliar face, they would be quick to identify that face as an outsider. On top of that, nobody else had gone off at this shop. It was a bus stop that they normally just passed on by. Somebody actually getting off there. There was no doubt that it had drawn some attention. But this wasn't a slip up. They were the ones who directed me to get off at this stop. There was nothing to worry about. I hope for your sake that's true, but honestly, I have no reason to, th to think that you are in any any danger. But just imagine if that kind if that kindly little vi that village officer directed you into some kind of trap just to be a dick, because after all, everybody's tense right now. Wouldn't that just be unfortunate? I knew that I was just nervous, since this was my first undercover assignment. My more seasoned colleagues referred to us as the new generation that didn't know how to lose their cool. But that wasn't true at all. In order to calm my breathing down. I exhaled the unpleasant air residing in the pit of my stomach. I couldn't help but pray that my apprehensions would disappear like the white clouds of exhaust expelled from the bus. There was a small shed there to, sever, to serve as shelter if it rained, and it was there I decided to wait. Inside the shed, one wall was plastered with posters advertising the damn opposition efforts. It was like the heartfelt screams of the villagers were recorded on that wall. Inside that shelter, I felt an inexplicable pressure. It wasn't like I had any real, any real relation to the dam project, but it still made me feel hesitant about being inside there. That was just how filled with the force of denial that space was. And... Inside that uneasy space was a girl. Hey, Rika! What are you doing here? Wait a minute. Are you? Are you the person that they, that they that they sent to guide me, to watch over me? That's kind of odd. I mean, I would think that they would send just a regular adult or something. Inside that shed covered in words, written in broad rush strokes, berating the policies regarding the dam and calling for action. There was a girl sitting there with a drowsy gaze. 
as if half asleep. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I changed the damn language by accident. The two images clashed so much that I could only stand there dumbfounded for a moment, trapped in such a surreal environment. If I stepped inside, who knew what kind of oafish noises I would accidentally make? I couldn't be disturbing this girl's slumber like that. Having thought this, I gave up on entering the shed. It was just a sleeping kid, so why was I so worked up about it? Finally, I realized. This girl, to us, as a married couple, was the very image of our ideal child. Even after numerous examinations at the hospital, we didn't know for sure what our child's gender was. Whether we could tell if they were a boy or a girl, if they were a boy, let me reread that. Whether we could tell if they were a boy or girl was, in the end, dependent on whether or not we could get an image of their genitalia. There was, of course, no guarantee that it was a girl. But with things the way they were, the possibility was high. Maybe they got maybe they got really tiny balls even for a fetus. Even so, Yuki had been saying that the chances that it was a boy or girl were even. But in my heart, I had already decided that our coming child was a girl. Since the day I decided that until now, it was so fun to imagine how our child would grow up that I couldn't help myself. Amongst those numerous imagined forms, the one that I thought to be the most ideal had materialized right in front of me. Of course, a little of it was due to the circumstances. In my ideal image, her hair would be on the short side. The girl in front of me, though, had long hair. It was almost as if somebody had taken my ideal and made some small adjustments. It certainly wasn't something unpleasant. Even so, I felt like I was selling her just by looking at her like that. She had an immaculate, no, a divine air about her. Dear God, look at that yawn. Look at that yawn face. And look at that half-lidded, tired expression. That girl with the angelic smile, with a yawn wide enough you could see her maulers, woke up all of a sudden. I didn't mean to peep. But locking eyes of a girl who had just woken up like this somehow made me feel like I was playing a prank on her. I wasn't doing anything shady, but I became flustered. The girl spoke. No. Cried out? If you're crying out, then I should be concerned, shouldn't I? Me. <coughs> Never mind. I totally should not be concerned at all. So, uh, Rika! Hi! How are you doing? Meep? Like that character on the show of the puppets? With the orange hair? I have no idea what puppet show you're referring to. I thought it was just one of those gre those greetings kids do. So in order to prove I wasn't a suspicious person, I responded in kind. Me. Meep. Me. <laughs> Me. The girl stared at me dubiously with a doll-like expression. 
cute, but cold and hard to read. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. There was, after all, an unfamiliar man right in front of her when she woke up, who responded with meep when she said the same. Suspicious. She definitely thought I was suspicious. Me. Me? Peem? Now look what I did. I struck them both silent. I'm really good at fucking things up. We were both at a loss for words. I know! I'm just special! No, the only one lost was me. The girl in front of me, as if inquiring about my motives, stared at me intently. In this silence, I felt like I was the one who had to say something first. Damn it. This girl was way better at interrogating somebody than Ushi. Uh, 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 I'm not anybody suspicious. I'm... I think we should adopt that as our as our nickname, or at least our title, while we're with her. Yes, ma'am. I am listening. What I could only have described as a cold expression suddenly blossomed into a smile, one that soon infected me. You might be familiar with the term angelic smile. To me, it was like that phrase was created just to describe the smile she gave me. The girl was smiling while saying, Nipa! Probably, to, probably wanted me to return the favor in kind. That's right. This was a kid's form of communication. Depends on the kid. Having the other person emulate what you just did was a rudimentary form of mutual understanding. Nipa. Nipa. It was a beautiful afternoon in the early summer. What was I doing? Communicating! Nipa. Nipa. Put some more zest into it, you asshat! Well, whatever. This was interesting in its own way. If somebody, if making somebody happy with just a smile was the work of angels, then this girl definitely was one of them. I couldn't help but pray that my own child, who was soon to be born, would grow up to be like this girl. That strangely gentle moment was finally brought to an end by the arrival of a car. An older person waved at me from the driver's seat, a dry smile plastered on their face. Hi there, good afternoon. Sorry for being late. Sorry for being late. Aw, so Rika isn't our guide. Damn it. That would have made things infinitely more interesting. You're the tourist who phoned yesterday, right? Uh, uh, yes. Sorry to keep you waiting. I'm running a little behind because of the farm. Hop right on in. It looks like the weather isn't going to hold up for much longer, so I'll show you around real quick. Huh? The weather? It changes fast around here. 
There will probably be even evening showers again today. If that happens, you won't be able to take any pictures. Come on, get in, get in. Meep. Turning around, the girl was standing right behind me with an intrigued expression. Her body language somehow reminded me of a stray cat that followed you around after you played with it a little. So charming. Maybe you should feed her. Because like the stray cat, maybe it's hungry. Hmm. Well, if it isn't Rika-chama! Praise be. Praise be! A girl named Rika with an immaculate smile, and an old man praising her while rubbing prayer beads in his hands. It was a rather mysterious sight to behold. So the girl turns to her face at me, tilting her head a little in a cutesy manner. After seeing that, the elder introduces me as a tourist who came to sightsee Hinamizawa. The youngin who came to the village for sightseeing. The girl, Rigachan, said that with a smile as she clung onto my arm. Money. The cat, it clings! Well, yeah. I heard that this village was sur is surrounded by a precious nature reserve, so I very much wanted to record that with my camera. You know I look like, even though I look like this, I really like to take pictures. Tomitaki Mark II. Ah, so he is already here. Or has been. I think he's, if memory serves, Tomotaki already still occasionally uh, visited Hinamizawa at least a few years before, at least a few years before the curse murders started taking place, if I recall cor no wait, he was, why am, why is my, why is my knowledge of his background failing me now, why? God damn it, I really need to take some actual notes. Can't keep everything to my noggin, it's unreliable. Fuck. Tomitaki Mark II. Uh, huh? Tomitaki? Tomitaki? Uh huh? Makino? 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 Is it okay if I come along too? I couldn't. You could come along, Rikachama, but there's nothing interesting to see. You should go play near the shrine or something. Now look what you're doing, old man. You're making the cat sad. Do you want to make the cat sad? I know I wouldn't. A distinctively displeased expression creeped across Rikachan's face. Being able to show one's emotions honestly on their faces was a privilege young children had. If it's not too much of a problem, could you bring this child along with us? When I said those helpful words, another smile spread across Rikachan's face with another Nipa as she clung to me again. <sighs> Not bad at all. I want this girl. To call me Papa. Dear God, I think he's channeling Keiichi right now. No. Father. Dad. Daddy. <clears throat> really channeling him hard right now. What am I doing? You're channeling, you're channeling a hormonal teenager, my friend. Ever since I met this girl, I was completely off my game. Just calm down. 
Nothing I can do, I guess. Rika-chama wa dame da yutemo kikan shi na. Rika-chama never listens even if you say no. Sittarun to onore kudashi. Come on, hop in. Sasa, Rika-chama mo. Come now, Rika- Come now, Rika-chama too. The old man descended from the driver's seat and opened up the sliding door of the van, which had Onigafuchi Alliance Town Council uh, stenciled on the side. Rikachan brushed me aside, dove into a seat, and began bouncing around right away. It, sent, it seemed like she was thoroughly enjoying the bouncy springs. Come on, Come on now, Rikachama. If you're like that, our guest can't sit down. I will stand! Hey, Rikachama! I can always squat too! <sighs> Girls are nice. I wonder if my child will play around like this too. I'd be concerned if they didn't play around. No, 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 no! It was written in that guide to raising a child that you shouldn't dote on them. Kids are kids. If you don't raise them strictly without spoiling them. It's soft and springy, Nipa. Nipa. I am definitely going to be a terrible father. It was decided that I would be a doting parent before my child was even born. Well then, sir, I'll show you around some places that I think look nice. Have you eaten lunch yet? Yeah. I had a light meal at the hotel. Is that so? Well then, let's get going. We're setting off on a tour of Hinamizawa. Yay! Um... Is it alright if I call you Rika-chan? Sure. My name is Rika Furud. I can already do addition in the tens digit. Oh, is that true? Well, congratulations, Rika! That's... Amazing. <laughs> I don't count on my fingers. Doubly amazing! I can do it all in my head. The way she insisted upon that was just too cute. At some point, the nervousness I had about being alone in enemy territory had evaporated like it was never there at all. I had to be at least a little thankful that I met this girl. Yeah! Well then, let's get going. It's time for Hinamizawa nature watching. The old man stepped on the gas with a great deal of gusto. Well, here's that old familiar bridge again. Happy memories! Oh, that's cute. She just poked her little head in the corner. The old man, who's apparently named Makino. Was he the same Makino that was listed as the auditor of the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance? Show me around places that were all breathtaking. Even though I wasn't really here for sightseeing, I couldn't help but be impressed. First of all, this was different from the simple scenery of a city. A scenery, the scenery of a charming village like this, no matter how mundane it seemed to the villagers, had a tranquil appeal to it. I know, isn't it grand? And I'm not being sarcastic.
At first, I was only re releasing the shutter as part of my tourist act, but midway through I found myself taking pictures out of pure interest. Tourist traps had their own unique allure to them, but there was nothing like that here. I was especially captivated by the unspoiled nature of the place. If there wasn't a, the whole, that whole uproar of the dam, I would want to bring Yukie he, with me here some other time. I wanted her to breathe in this fresh air, as well as show her this rejuvenating verdant scenery. Is something like this that interesting? Well, of course it is, Rika! Look at how well placed all those bricks are! It's just fine craftsmanship right there. And there's barely any any hint uh, any hint of moss or anything on them. You're a strange person, Akasaka. Yeah. No. no, these cylindrical mailboxes are rare nowadays. Who gives a shit about mailboxes? Look at the damn bricks! They have a certain nostalgic air about them. You wouldn't happen to think they're elegant, would you? <laughs> is Hinamizawa fun? Half the time it is, yes. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Once she's discharged from the hospital, I'd like to bring my wife here at least once. With that with the child that would be born by that time. Right now she's in the hospital waiting to give birth. She's due any day now. <laughs> <laughs> Be nice if they're a cute girl like you. Sir, it seems like congratulations are soon to be in order. <laughs> Still, that's not good. <laughs> to leave your wife behind and play around in a place like this, my job forced me to! I know it's horrible, but I mean, shit! I was momentarily at a loss for words. It was exactly how Makino said. There was no good reason for a man who was waiting for his wife to give birth to be playing around idly in this place. Did I slip up? Maybe a little? Uh... Uh... Ma. Uh... Well... Uh, we already planned this trip to Hinamizawa a long time ago. My wife's family is with her, so it's alright. If you had this plan so far in advance, then how come you didn't make the sign up deadline for the nature watching? If you did, you could have toured around on a nice bus instead of being cramped up in here. I suck at scheduling things. I always had. It didn't seem as if Makino was actually digging for anything. But if this conversation continued any longer, it would put some unexpected holes in my cover. I halted the conversation by pretending to take another picture. Well then, for our last stop, I'll take you to the place with the best view. We're gonna overlook the whole village, aren't we? It was slightly before evening. The sun was still burning brightly. But a cool breeze had begun to mix itself in the air, into the air. It seems my exploration of Hinamazawa with Rika-chan was just about done. The place with the best view? 
境内からの景色さを得て、他にはありませんやね。Wow, Rikachama, where else could it be but the view from around the shrine? I was just going to suggest the shrine. Hearing that, Rikachan smiled even more. Well, then, I'll introduce you to my home, Akasaka. Huh? By Rikachan's home, you mean. Huh? The shrine. Perude Shrine. There's an observation platform. You can see some real pretty scenery. Furude Shrine. The girl, who, the girl who called Furude Shrine her home, Rika. If I remembered correctly, her full name was Rika Furud. And Furud was. That's right. One to three families. The unit of the Sonozaki family is said to hold all the actual power. It was still one of the old houses that held some authority. No, more important than that right now was Furud Shrine. If I remembered correctly, Ushi had told me. Within the grounds of the Furud Shrine, there were the offices of the Onikofuchi Defense Alliance. And since the land around Farouk's shrine were private property, the police couldn't set foot there heedlessly. Farouk's shrine, where even Uushi couldn't simply set foot into. The main base of operations for the Onikofuchi Defense Alliance. I've been given the unexpected opportunity to enter there. Don't make, don't do anything stupid now. I couldn't have asked for more. I'm looking forward to it. Please, if you would. Well then, let's get there quick. The weather seems to be getting a little iffy. The sky had suddenly become overcast. It wouldn't be odd if it started raining soon. The Kikadas, as if trying to finish their daily allotment of chirps before the evening, cried out even more fervently. The van stopped in the shrine's parking lot. Also parked there were numerous other vans with loudspeakers mounted on top of them to act as makeshift propaganda vehicles. On the side of each vehicle was scrawled, the dam project must be demolished. Defend our homeland to the last. No Oyashiro-sama's anger. Or a slogan of a similar kind. They gave the feeling that even without using the loudspeakers, there was enough of to overwhelm any onlookers. Vertical banners were erected in various places. The contents of those banners were similar. They were all, ob they were all objections against the dam, or crude insults towards the government. There were horizontal banners, placards, and so on and so forth. They proclaimed that without a doubt, this was the headquarters of the Onikofuchi Defense Alliance. For Rika, however, this hectic place was also her home. We've arrived. With how, with how busy it must be here on a regular basis, you must not get a lot of quiet moments here at home, huh? We've arrived. I'm home. Rika-chan crawled over, over my lap and exited the vehicle first. Makano had noticed I was looking at protest banners. The shrine also has the offices of the anti-dam movement.
For you, this probably brings back memories of the anti-security treaty conflicts back in the, in the day. <laughs> Student movements against government policies. Movements that bordered on terrorist activity were at one point commonplace, if only in order to garner global attention. Students holding out in lecture halls, brawling with the riot squads that charged in. It was an age where wasting one's youth like that was wisely considered a road to glory. It was slightly before my time. I'm not really an activist or anything. I studied without incident and graduated without incident. I don't really agree. I don't really agree with the violence or occupations they use to protest the government's policies. Huh? Oh? You have quite a nice opinion there. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it. If you have an opinion on a policy, vote for the candidate who shares your view, or enter the political world yourself and assert your beliefs in a lawful manner. That is the foundation of democracy. I don't think that's, don't think that's something you should challenge with violence. Yeah, well, in an ideal world, I would fully, I would fully agree with you, but unfortunately, with there are a lot of politicians and a lot of democratic societies and a lot of places around the world that don't like to play by the rules. So sometimes a little bit of grassroots activism is needed, as, as unfortunate as that might be, as that might be to admit. But like I said, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have any need to do anything like that ever for any reason, no matter what, which part of the world you're in. For a youngin, you have some fine beliefs. I saw that feeling of respect reflected in Makino's gaze. At that moment, something tugged at my sleeve. The cat wants your attention. I have no idea what Akasaka is saying. You must speak in the cat's language, Akasaka. Rika-chan, feeling like she was, the on she was the only one who didn't understand the conversation, had a look of displeasure on her face. The expression was so charming, I had to keep myself from grinning like an idiot. It's often said that a father wants to spoil his daughter rotten. I think I understood that feeling very well. Sorry. It was a little bit hard for Rika-chan to understand, wasn't it? Japan is a peaceful country, so you have to argue your point in a peaceful manner. You shouldn't resort to violence, in other words. No matter how much I explained, a girl who was just boasting about being able to carry digits over when adding things probably wouldn't understand. It probably wasn't something to talk about in front of Rika-chan anyway. So then, Akasaka. That's a rather serious expression you're wearing. I don't think I ever seen you wear it before. How do you think we should keep our village from being flooded by the dam? Straight to the point. Even if I regretted my careless words, it was too late now. Here I was, at the main headquarters of an organization, telling them their way of doing things was illegal. Preaching that violence was not the answer. A complicated feeling had mixed it, itself in with the respect in Makino's gaze. 
It was then that I finally realized. It wasn't that simple. There wasn't a soul who would argue that what I was saying wasn't correct. Using violence to get one's way was something that everybody knew you shouldn't be proud of. However, right now, Hinamazawa was in a predicament that couldn't be overcome with peaceful means alone. Exactly. Sometimes you gotta make it. Sometimes you gotta break. Sometimes to make an omelet, you gotta break a few eggs, you know? And right now, that omelet is what's needed to save this village. The legality of the Hinamazawa Dam project, through the efforts of the various propaganda campaigns enacted by the Onikofuchi Defense Alliance, was being called into question. If they further strengthened their campaign, they might be able to suspend or change the construction plans. But that was, at the most, just a possibility. If the government proceeded with the construction as planned, it wouldn't be long before this place was at the bottom of a lake. If it wasn't for the unrestrained, unrestrained resistance of the residents of Hidamazawa, this place might already have been underwater. <laughs> We can't live anywhere else other than here. We can't live in the city. The words of this remarkably young girl were all too accurate, carrying with them the screams of the hearts and minds of the residents of Hinamazawa. I do wonder, though, is it is this something that you're... Do you know all this already? Because this is just... Thing, these are things you just noticed yourself, Rika? Or have you just been hearing a lot of the adults talking around you? I mean, I understand that this is a very serious situation that, that you're all in here, but it does make me concerned here. Just... Well... It's not exactly a good way to bring a sense of security into a child's life when you're constantly talking about how their home very well may end up being destroyed at some point soon. Without, at least not without any absolute certainty that's going to happen, you know? Like, if I were in, like, I, if I were in the adult's position, I at least try to minimize the serious discussion around uh, around Rika as close as possible because well you don't want to give her a reason to worry too much you know she's she's young and like i just said at this point in the story anyway it's not 100% certain that the project is going to proceed uh, proceed on as planned without delay anyway so i know that's probably I know I'm probably uh, asking for something impossible. I'd probably I'm probably asking or suggesting something impossible here, given the circumstances. But it's just again, I'm just I'm just thinking about Rika's well-being here, because this because like I just said, with all this stuff going on, this can't exactly be a happy time to for a child as young as her to be living in right now. Of course, there was nothing I could say to respond to that. I could only respond to Makino and Rikachan's heavy words with silence. I'm sorry. This isn't a problem that an outsider should lightly just poke their nose into, is it? I apologize. Makino, unsure of how to reply for a while, could only laugh pointlessly. <laughs> It's nothing that concerns guests that make their home somewhere else. If you enjoy it here, 
Please tell all your friends that Himazawa is a wonderful place, please. Honestly, I would... I would argue that this what's happening here should concern other rural areas in Japan because I would assume that be, I would assume based on my own limited very limited understanding of of, ja of the Japanese legal system that if this damn project were to proceed without 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 any further delay and it actually happens it would set a kind of legal precedent that would make it a lot harder for any other rural areas in in Japan to uh, fight against if any other villages in certain areas might end up getting in the way of some expansion or construction projects or anything the like that the government may want to fund or put in place, you know? Whereas if they some whereas if Hinamizawa were to succeed in defend, in legally fending this off, then well it would make it would by by extension make it easier for any other area rural areas to fight off similar similar attempts that might be made in their own areas because there would be a legal precedent that they could cite to show to, to you know to show the courts the judges whatever hey a similar incident happened a similar incident like the one that's going on here happened at this point in this location at this date and we think that you should rule in the x in this t in this sort of way based on the precedent that was set in this in this previous uh in this previous case y you know what i'm saying but again i as i just stated i have very 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 limited knowledge very minimal knowledge in fact of the japanese legal system but i but if memory serves there is such a thing as legal precedent, yes. So, because of that, if that's indeed the if that's indeed the case, then Hinamizawa may end up doing a lot of other places around the country a favor if they could actually win this whole thing. But it all, of course, depends on how they go about it too. Anyway, sorry about that. It's just, I just something I felt like. Yeah. I mean, I was. I mean, I've been thinking on and off about that little tip here and how it it's applying to what I'm seeing in the chapter here, and I just been thinking, well. There are there there definitely are situations in life where, say, you're in one clock and something else is hap is going on in another clock that whatever's going on in clock B should concern you because all the all the neighboring clocks might be more inter interconnected than you may realize. That's all I'm trying to say. The same is undoubtedly true for neighborhood for. Well, well, prefectures and countries and even international stuff too. Everything, everything is connected in some fashion or another, and what and what goes and what happens in one area may end up impacting other areas in ways that nobody may be able to see coming. And the, and the changes could all be they can all start as small as a tiny little gear in the clock. That be that gear being, of course, a single individual, the or the actions a single individual could take. I hope I'm making sense here. If word spreads to dozens, maybe even hundreds of people, then that ridiculous plan to submerge this place, mate, at the foot of a dam, will eventually fall apart. He followed that with a smile that said, Please don't think much of it. Makino letting me worry that much was, was, was a stroke of good fortune. Becoming infatuated with the idea of making friends with a little girl had made me completely forget my apprehension at being in enemy territory. Being reminded of this right before I was going to, to step foot into their headquarters... Might have been a good thing. 
If we had this exchange in the middle of their office, if there was a short-tempered youth in there that might have come at me, thinking how extreme, extreme they were, in the worst case, my life could have been in danger. It seemed that I looked quite despondent from at that moment. Makino, thinking he had said something wrong, became flustered trying to think of a way to improve my mood. I was a bit careless just now. I'm, I'm very sorry. No. Don't worry that much about it. I'm sorry. The sites you showed me around the village were all beautiful, wonderful places. I really do want to come here one more time. If this beautiful village is going to be submerged at the bottom of a lake, I can understand why you would fight so desperately. I had somehow managed to use my despondent look to change the topic in my favor. After a bit, Makino had returned to his usual high spirits. It seemed he believed I had completely sympathized with his point of view. So, so. Now, now. Let's leave the talk at that for now. There's a place around here with a really great view. Let's go, Akasaka. Rika-chan, seemingly happy to be free from all the boring and gloomy adult talk, bounded up the step stone, the stone steps. There was no real need to run, but in order to catch up with her, I also darted up the steps. Be considerate of the old man, he might not be able to run as fast as you guys. There were several tents belonging to the town council erected on the shrine grounds. Inside the tents were several folding tables and chairs, and a number of the old town council members were livening things up with, with chit-chat. They weren't saying anything incendiary like the dam project must be destroyed. It was just some relaxed aisle chit-chat between local geezers the normal sort of calming scenery. At the entrance of a shed that looked like a meeting place, there was a large sign erected with Onigofuji Defense Alliance headquarters written in bold brush strokes. That was their base of operations. To be honest, it was a bit of a letdown. If you asked what I had been imagining, this is a bit embarrassing, but I'd have thought it would be something much more dramatic, with barbed wire fences and barricades. My first impression of the place, though, was completely different from that. It looked like a simple backwater town hall. It didn't look anything other than exactly that. The old folks who were chatting had noticed Rika-chan's presence. Well, isn't it Rika-chama? It's time for little kids to head on home. This is my home. Thank you. I was... I was like seconds away from pointing that out. The old folks guffawed, since she wasn't wrong. From that exchange, I could tell that this Rika Fruit girl was loved by everybody. Kichiro? Wait a minute. Kichiro. Are you the mayor? From chapter 2? Makino-san, who's that? The tourist who phoned. That's right. 
こちら村長さんに日の目沢の君よし村長さん。This is the mayor of Hinamezawa, Mayor Kimiyoshi. I knew it! I did remember right. So, we actually get to see what you look like for once. You definitely have the image of the kindly old man nailed down, that's for sure. He smiled brightly. But there was no mistaking he would be scary if he got angry. By the look of, thing, looks of things, this old man was the president of the Onikofuchi Defense Alliance. None other than Ki,、uh, Kichi,、uh, Kichiru Kimiyoshi himself. Welcome to Hinamizawa. What do you think? It's a quiet and relaxing place, isn't it? Yeah. 今日一日美しい場所をいくつも堪能させていただきました貴重な機会をお与えくださったことを感謝します being, ふぅ、hmm. 今時の若い方なのにまた紳士な方だね you know you're one of those youngins you're quite the gentleman Kichiro, Akasaka ni Miharashi no ee to koro an nai s t a i no d e s i o I want to show Akasaka a cool place. You're not thinking about showing、uh, me that, um, ritual storehouse, are you? Thinking that the formalities between myself and the mayor had gone on for too long, Rika chan butted into the conversation. Or wait, no, we're talking about the officer patient platform. Duh. For her to call, to call the mayor by his first name. I felt it was a little strange, but none of the villagers seemed to mind. A girl of the Fruit household, one to three families. She was probably different than the average villager. Akasaka, Akasaka over here. Rika chan tugged at my sleeve. Not resisting, I allowed myself to be pulled over. And waiting for me was a magnificent view. <sighs> There it is. <sighs> This is amazing. It was an observation deck that looked down on the village. They. Knowing that this was the best view in the entire village, kept quiet as I stood there awestruck. I was holding a camera, but I had completely forgotten to even glance through the viewfinder. This view, no matter what kind of film it was printed on, it wouldn't be able to show everything. If there was a way to explain it, It would only be what I would be able to put into words. It was just such a breathtakingly spectacular view that I struggled to find a comparison. For a while, I was left awestruck. I could only stand there and wonder. A cool breeze helped abate the heat rushing through my body. That comfortable sensation also left me speechless. Rika chan, who had been holding on to my sleeve the entire time, spoke. This is my favorite spot. As she said that, she showed me another adorable smile. That smile seemed very fleeting. If you ask why, that was because the view from her favorite spot. Would eventually be submerged under the deep green waters of the dam reservoir. I just can't believe that this village is going to end up at the bottom of a lake. I sat quietly so that only Rika Chen could hear it. I regretted it as soon as I did. 
for those words were all too cruel. However, Rika-chan didn't, see, didn't let them cast a cloud on her expression. In fact, she replied with a smile. It won't sink. The dam project will definitely go away. It was just like a little girl to say something like that. There was no basis for her saying so. It was just her wish. Akasaka, do you think that this village will be submerged? It'll be submerged, all right, but not in water. Some, it'd be something a lot more lethal, shall we say. You know, if um, chapter three, the how that ended, is any indication. Assuming that's something that would just eventually happen regardless of what, what actually occurs throughout the story. Although to be fair, that everybody 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 being vo volcanically gassed to death only occurred once. So maybe that was just a one-off thing. I know that's kind of un an unlikely assumption, but I got to be optimistic. Sometimes. It's not that I want it to be. I knew how important the dam was. I knew that it was necessary. I just didn't want to recognize the sacrifices that would be made. I agreed with the project in general, but couldn't agree with some of the details. But... If it meant that this girl's beloved scenery wouldn't be taken away from her, I might be able to object to the dam. I might be able to ignore the interests of the nation, the development of Japan, all for the sake of one girl's smile. It's not really much of a humanist. I'm not really much of a humanist, but... How sentimental of me. It won't be submerged. Because the dam project will soon go away. Her words weren't just hopes and dreams, but were seasoned with a hint of resolve. As if she was talking about an unchangeably predetermined outcome. As surely as the sun rising in the east. It'll be gone soon? Why not ask her why she believed that? I turned around. Hi. Yes. It'll be gone. What makes you say that? Well, you see. She seemed to want to answer, but as though unable to find the right words, she swallowed back what she was about to say. Rika, you wouldn't happen to know anything about that little kidnapping that occurred recently, would you? Even a tiny little detail? Did you overhear the adults say something about that at some point? Regardless of what Akasaka does, the dam project will end this year. It's already been decided. That was a lie. If something like that had already been decided, the Oni Kafuchi Defense Alliance would have no reason to continue existing. From my point of view, it was like they were doing nothing more than throwing themselves into an endless battle. If they knew the dam project was cancelled, it would feel much more it would feel much more relaxed around here. 
This village, though, could hardly be called relaxed. For evidence of that, I just had to remember how charged the atmosphere was at the checkpoint or at the bus stop. The villagers, with their misplaced resolve, were still fighting. And this girl, even knowing the villagers' grim resolve, had already declared their victory. The villagers, throwing themselves into this endless war, and this op optimistic girl who said they had already won. That contrast was somehow strange. Why do you think that? If you know something that makes you that confident, could you tell me? Rika-chan stayed silent for a while, seemingly choosing what to say. Because... Okay. Just because. Got it. The almighty because. Date. Because... She looked like she was lost in whether she should continue or not. As if she, she was troubled on whether it was okay for her to say it. That kind of expression. It's already been decided. There's no other way to say it. It's already, been, it's already been decided, huh? It really is just like a little girl to say something like that. I can't believe it was actually true. She was the only one saying such things with confidence. My real mission, that I had forgotten about during this fun-filled day, resurfaced at the back of my mind. The kidnapping of the minister's grandson. Had the Onikofuchi Defense Alliance kidnapped the minister's grandson and already succeeded in negotiating with the cancellation of the dam project? Did Kimiyoshi actually already know that and was just playing dumb? Was that what this girl was telling me? It's possible. Depending on how Akasaka. what she knows. Akasaka. The girl called out my name suddenly. Nandai. What is it? Tokyo e kaere. Go back to Tokyo. Why? Why should I go back? Huh? I wasn't only surprised at that sudden command. Ever since I came to this village, I had never once mentioned I was from Tokyo. So how does she know, then? Well, based on my accent, she might have been able to guess where I was from. What was I getting so worked up over? Yeah, well, just because you have a, an accent from there doesn't necessarily mean you live there, you know? Which is why it makes me really wonder, how do you know this, Rika? It was probably the sudden and complete change in her demeanor. You should definitely go back to Tokyo right away. If not, you will woefully regret it. This is very unlike you, Rika. Are you okay? The girl I've been holding my sleeve the entire time. She'd been tugging at my sleeve since hurriedly dragging me over to show me this wonderful view. But this was the adorable Rika-chan, who I'd spent the entire day with. There was no way she could have been replaced with a doppelganger when I wasn't looking. my sleeve this entire time, but somehow this girl was someone other than Rika-chan. She looked like Rika-chan, but she wasn't. This was some girl I'd never met before. 
that girl had told me in an indifferent voice that I would re eventually regret, regret coming to this village from the bottom of my heart. That would be an incredibly pathetic thing to see. So I thought I'd warn you right now. You sound you don't even sound like a child anymore. What the hell? Why would I come to regret it? Stop whining. I couldn't believe that I was hearing such cold words come from Rika-chan's mouth. I just couldn't believe it. Was somebody impersonating her? Using ventri ventriloquism or something? I think it's more likely that maybe there is a hidden side to Rika that I've never known about until now. Or maybe you're just not really fond of outsiders. I don't... Well, then again, that that's not really a different argument now, is it? Thinking that, I wanted to take a look around, but... The girl's gaze had me pinned down, making me unable to move. When you tried crossing the road, when the don't walk sign was up, did your parents finish explaining why it was dangerous before pulling you back to the sidewalk? They'd pull you back right away, wouldn't they? They'd pull you back before explaining why it was dangerous, wouldn't they? In other words, it's something like that. So translation. Don't 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 stick your nose into it. Just do what I tell you, or else. The girl I'd spent time with. Rika Farood would not speak like that. She would speak with acuteness befitting her age, with brief childish remarks, expressing her emotions honestly. She definitely wouldn't speak with such pointed words. I've warned you. Don't get the wrong idea. It's not like I'm saying this because I hate you. You don't need to tell somebody who's better off dead that they're in danger. What the hell? Who? Are you? Rika-chan. You're, you're not Rika-chan. I did. I like this expression even less. As soon as I accused her of not being Rika-chan, she let out a strange, quiet giggle. It was a laugh not befitting a child of her age. It was like she was possessed by something. Her change was just that total and complete. Was Rika-chan being attacked by some terrifying phenomenon? That cull idea came to mind without any sort of hesitation. Rika-chan is acting strange. Somebody. Help! Thinking I'd, that I'd yell that, I turned to where the mare was. I, I immediately realized he wasn't looking at us with a smile. 
That's right. To him, it looked, it looked like nothing more than me and Rikachan fooling around. He didn't notice that there was something terrifying happening to her. Akasaka is such a coward. <laughs> I really don't like this at all. I feel just as unnerved about it as Akasaka is, probably is feeling right now. The girl had obviously grasped that I was afraid. Noticing that and calling me a coward, she laughed again. That cackling girl, approaching me in a strange manner while still laughing, lost her balance and fell flat on her face. Rika-chan fell down. If it was just a, a while before, I would have extended a hand to help, help her up without hesitation. But now, extending a hand to this ominous girl who looked like Rika-chan but wasn't, required a bit more courage than I had at the moment. Me... What the hell are you, Rika? I'm trying to think. I don't I don't think I've ever seen even so much as a hint of this before now. This radical change in personality. What What the hell did I just witness? Is there really a hidden side to you that I've... That nobody's known about? Because I gotta say, if that's what that is, this is certainly unnerving. Or maybe it's a split personality kind of thing. Where you got a personality that behaves and sounds more closer to a sadistic adult. But that, if that was the case, then, but that, no, but no, that can't be it. If that's the case, then I would have seen, I would have probably seen some sort of hint about, no, wait a minute. There was a tip back in chapter one that talked about split personalities, wasn't there? Is that what this is? Information from a tip all the way back in chapter one now becoming relevant here? The girl cried out thus. She then squir squirmed upright and dusted herself off. Afterwards, she looked around restlessly as a blank expression crept across her face. You gotta be kidding me. Was she making fun of me? That way of acting. It was as though... After being possessed by something, she had lost her memories of what happened. You're joking, right? Rika. Rika. Jan. Me. I don't know if Rika Chan had heard me or not. She just cried out like that, as if questioning herself. Hey, mister! Rika-chama too! Tea's ready! There's some snacks too, so please come and have some! An old lady wearing a smock was waving energetically from the entrance of the office. Hearing that there were snacks, Rikachan's expression changed. Hi, Yay! A carefree smile. That was a familiar smile. 
the one that belonged to the embodiment of my ideal daughter. Any hint of the creepy girl that was just there, spouting sinister words, had vanished. Come on, Rika-chama. Wash your hands first. There aren't any manju here for dirty hands. You know what? I just had a fear. I just have a. I just thought of something. Maybe that's why you ended up in a trash can with your gut with gutted like a fish at the end of chapter three, because the wrong person for you managed to see your true person, see your true sinister personality. They didn't like what they saw one bit, and so they reacted with extreme prejudice. I honestly have no idea if that's actually true or not, but I'm I'm just trying to think. I'm j I'm just trying to think. Like okay, so what I guess there were let's just say for the sake of argument that this what I just saw here is not a possession uh, not not possession by demons or anything like that and it's not a split personality. But it's like a hidden side to her or something. Although I guess split personality wouldn't be too far out of the question. But whatever. Let's just say it's one of those things. I don't recall ever seeing a hint of any of this at all throughout the previous three chapters. That there is something more to Rika's personality than someone who was generally... Well then, well, I don't know. Perceptive is being per very perceptive was certainly one thing, but I mean, the few moments where she exp displayed a sh great amount of perception, like when she managed to piece together what Keiichi did, breaking into that ritual storehouse in Chapter 2, I mean, yeah, that's one thing. That's impressive, for sure. But that didn't denote any malevolence of, or sadism or anything like that to me at all. But what I just saw here... That this is something on a whole nother level. There has the reason I'm thinking I'm I'm thinking about this is I, every now and then I'm try I try to think why was she killed at chapter three at the end of chapter three? There has to be a reason for that. Why she was killed the way she was was like was is it something that was. If it, if, was it something that was in, in some way similar to why people were killed in Chapter 2? Or is, is it something totally different? Just why? So this whole thing just now popping up out of nowhere just is just making me revisit that question even more and thinking, is this in some insane way related to that? And I'll admit, I have absolutely nothing... To really base this suspicion of mine on. But it's just... I don't know. Except, Well, I do know one thing, at least. I, there's clearly more to you than meets the eye, Rika. And somehow... Either you just hit it so damn well... That I just thought of nothing of even the tiniest of, of hints... That you may have been displaying all of the way up till this point. Or, wait a minute. God damn it, I lost my train of thought again. Fuck! <sighs> Whatever. Let's just continue. Come on, Rika. There aren't any manju here for dirty hands. I'll wash them real good. Rika-chan responded with vigor, running off to the washing station that was along the side of the office. She stopped halfway, turning around to call me. If Akasaka doesn't hurry up, I'll eat his share of manju too. They're steaming fresh. People who don't wash their hands aren't allowed to eat any manju. No matter how you look at it, it was Rika-chan. 
Those words and the way she said them. No matter how you heard them, they were definitely Rika Chan's. Come on now, mister! You're the adult here, so show her how it's done! For all I know, Rika-chan here might be more adult in some ways than I've ever realized, so... I think maybe I should see if she actually knows how to do it first. Just to be sure. The old lady urged me to wash my hands. Without any resistance, I lined up beside Rika-chan at the wash station. Splish splash. I stared at Rika-chan, intent on washing her hands properly, like she had probably learned at school. Me? Did I do something wrong? Uh, by wrong, you mean? I'm washing my hands. I only got four gold stickers for it. If it wasn't for that scene I just witnessed, witnessed, I would, I would honestly say how cute it is that you even got gold stickers for washing your hands. But now. I find it impossible to comment on how cute that is. Oh, wait. That was a comment on it. Never mind. I think Rika I think Rika's other personality kind of broke my brain a bit. I'm prob I'm probably bad at washing my hands. You're not doing anything wrong. If you're washing them that carefully, that's more than enough. But, but it's not, Akasaka. If you don't use a brush and clean out the dirt underneath your fingernails, you won't get a gold sticker. Hmm. Hmm. Rika-chan, Rika-chan, you're very dil diligent. That's something to be proud of. I was praised by Akasaka. No matter how you looked at it, it was Rika-chan. There was no trace of that girl from before. Exactly what was that sinister girl? Rika-chan, Rika-chan, what was the meaning of what just happened now? Just now, you told me to go back to Tokyo, didn't you? Did I say that? Plain dumb? I was at a loss for words. She didn't remember what that girl just now had said. She could just be plain dumb. Like I would ever believe something as occult as that could happen. Like I would ever believe that Rika-chan could be possessed by that strange girl and say those creepy things. Rika-chan Rika You definitely said that. Me. Her expression told me that, despite my saying so, she had no idea. She wasn't playing dumb. She actually didn't know. This isn't enough to convince me. Otherwise, the only other possibilities I can think of are A, demonic possession, or B, split personality switch at the, well, not to drop a hat, but rather a face plant into the dirt. 
Exactly. What was that just now? Just as Rika Chan had, had, I had, I let a look of confusion creep across my face. Two of us, both looking like we had no idea what was going on, must have certainly been a humorous sight to behold. While partaking in, tea, while partaking of tea and snacks. I was shown a propaganda film shot by the Defense Alliance that highlighted their resistance efforts. Older folks talked passionately on how long and grueling the fight against the dam was, but they fell on deaf ears. I was transfixed by Rika-chan, who had heard these stories countless times before, and was nodding off. Eventually, Rika-chan noticed I was staring at her and smiled as she rubbed her eyes. That smile was Rika Chan's after all. There was no hint of that sinister shadow. After that, my unreasonable fear of Rika Chan lessened with the passing of time. I would call I wouldn't call it unreasonable, man. What we just saw was just totally out of left field. But I could by no means forget what had happened. It eventually grew dark. The mayor said they had prepared dinner, but I said I would but I said I would come again tomorrow and took my leave. I had to return to the hotel and file my regular report with the section chief. I see. Well then, please come again tomorrow. If you phone, we'll send somebody to pick you up right away. I appreciate your hospitality. I'll probably come again and enjoy myself tomorrow. Yes, please do. It seems that Rika Chama has taken a pretty big, big liking to you. I can believe if you said that she's taking a big interest to me, I would totally believe that. Liking though, I find that a bit hard to believe at the moment. Akasaka, are you coming again tomorrow? I finish after fifth period, so if you could come at around three o'clock, that would make me happy. Please come again. That pure smile urged me to do so. There wasn't a trace of that evil aura. I think we should listen to that evil aura, though. Call it gut instinct. Depending on what happened next, all that might end up as nothing all that might end up as nothing other than my hallucination. Thinking about it logically. If the daughter of the Fruit household, one of the three families, had taken a liking to me, then this was a strong foothold for my investigation from here on out. It was like a free ticket for a reason to visit Hinamazawa. If only I could treat that little incident as a figment of my imagination, then having this girl who was the embodiment of my ideal daughter grow so attached to me wasn't bad either. I successfully dove into the belly of the Onikofuchi Defense Alliance, and had the mayor as well as other important members of the Alliance welcome me with open arms. This was a great turn of events. However, I still felt uneasy. Getting back to the hotel, I forced it down an almost painfully cold beer until I could clear my mind. The shock from that incomprehensibly strange incident continued to torment me. You know more, you know some stuff, definitely. You know, you knew somehow I came from... Okay, we got three tips. You knew somehow he came from Tokyo. 
even though there is absolutely no logical reason I can think of it at all as to how you could possibly know that, let alone anybody else from the village. Yet somehow you know. And apparently, you also now now that I'm thinking now that now that I'm thinking about it, you seem to know for a fact that the dam project is going to end up stopping this year, that it's been decided. So you aren't so you probably know something's going to happen, don't you? Like, do you know about what's going to happen with the dam foreman? Something relating to the kidnappings, maybe? Both? That was a very different change in personality, to be sure, but I'm not quite willing to consider that it might be demonic possession. At this point, I'm more like I'm more I'm going with either split personality or she's just putting on an act. Right now, I'm leaning more towards the act. Because if it's a split personality kind of deal, it does make me wonder. Would a split personality... I really need to brush up my... I really need to brush up my knowledge on this stuff, but... I... Don't think necessarily in, in whatever few case studies there's been, it's been shown that in whatever studies or whatever little bits of the topic is known that a, a split personality may necessarily share the memories of the original personality. I really, I probably really shouldn't talk about this unless I have, have a more solid idea of what I'm actually saying here, but. I'm, I guess for now, I'll just go ahead and just stick to putting on a facade. Play, because right now, that is the least difficult thing that I may be able to wrap my head might be able to wrap my head around right now and also like I said before the only I never seen anything from Rika in particular that hinted towards me that hinted to me that she may have something like another side to her or like a split personality or anything like that But I do acknowledge that there was a tip all the way back in chapter one that talked about, well, split personalities. So maybe there's maybe this maybe the whole split personality thing has a little more ground for that has a little more ground to stand on than I'm willing to give credit right willing to give it credit at least for now. I think the most important takeaway thing I should take away from this right now, rather than trying to figure out just what the nature is of what I just seen, is apparently she knows a lot more about what's going on right now than what than what she's letting on. And she seems to know and she and the fact that she knows that I'm from Tokyo. I can probably assume then that she knows the who that she probably knows by extension. What it is I'm really doing here, and who I who I really am. I need to figure out how the hell she could have figured that inf all that stuff out, and then just go from there. I can I can try to I can solve I can try to solve the rest of the mysteries later. Anyway, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and cut things off here. 
we can uh, view the tips that I've uh, unlocked and continue on to the next part of chapter four in the next episode. Because uh, looking to me like we're we're not leaving. We're going to just ignore the warning that was given to us by this other Rika. And well, I imagine the consequences are not going to be pleasant in the slightest. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this latest episode of Higurashi When They Cry Chapter 4. If you did and you want to see more content from me, feel free to subscribe to my channel. I will see you all next time. Take care.